All right, everybody, let's get started. Uh, we're in lecture 16. Um, I am turning back the formula sheets uh, for the uh, for the exam. I have here that my goal is to get the exam graded by Friday. It might be Monday, because um, I kind of want to just knock them out all at once. Um, but I will keep everybody posted on that. Um, and uh, today, I'll, I will say that today's lecture is pretty simple. The topic we're about to do, it, it, it makes relatively reasonable sense. Um, I am going to do our first bolted connection homework today, which is going to be due on Friday. Um, but uh, you'll kind of understand why I decided to wait, because I didn't really want to go into information overload uh, during our... Um, during our first foray into bolts, like here's all this stuff, and by the way, here's the homework. I kind of wanted to just let that stuff seep in. All right, let's see. Okay, so today what we're gonna do is we're gonna finish our discussion on the basics of bolted connections, and then we're gonna get into a full-blown example. Um, so first off, let me just sort of recap. Um, this is the... Uh, I think this one slide summarizes really like everything that you need to know about the um, uh, about the lecture last time. So, uh, but just to you know give you some high level bullet points. So we um, uh, when we're looking at bolted connections, we said there are two classes of bolted connections that we're considering, and that is bolt uh, bearing type connections and slip critical connections. Both connections have to satisfy these two limit states. The only main difference is that um, uh, uh, slip critical connections have an additional limit state, which we will talk about later. Um, for bolt shear, we have a number of questions that we need to answer about a given bolt, such as uh, are the threads included in the shear plane? Are we dealing with one shear plane or two shear planes? Um, but the nice thing about table 7-1 is it sort of slices through all that and just gives us the answer. So, we don't really compute bolt shear capacity in here. We'll just look it up, okay? Um, now, for um, a bolt bearing, bolt bearing, we gotta go through and actually compute. Um, it is fairly straightforward, though, uh, and we were actually able to derive some fairly plug and chug expressions. Um, you sort of start at the bottom and work your way up, so we start with the hole diameter, and then from the hole diameter, go to the clear edge distances, and from the clear edge distances, compute capacities. We compute capacities for edge bolts and interior bolts. Um, so like for the connection at the bottom, we have four edge bolts and 16 interior bolts. So that's something I just want you to be able to identify on a given connection. Um, okay, uh, any questions about this? Okay, so what we need to talk about today, what we're missing is the idea of connection layout requirements. And so what we're really trying to uh, uh, ascertain are the following two questions. Um, how far apart can bolts be spaced from each other? And how far apart can bolts be spaced from the edge of the plate? Okay. And what we're talking about here, and so I want to take a step back here, these connection layout requirements have absolutely nothing to do with strength. Okay. Uh, and so what I mean by that is... Um, Passing or failing these connection limitations does in no way guarantee or affirm that the connection does or does not have enough strength to withstand loads. These connection ladder requirements have nothing to do with load, okay? nothing at all. Okay? And that will become clear as we get into them. But I just I wanted that said because I think that's, that's really important. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to talk about is bolt spacing. Okay? So what we're talking about is how far apart bolts can be spaced from each other. Now, whenever we delineate spacing requirements, we always talk about from center of hole to center of hole. <coughs> now, the reason why bolt uh, layouts are defined like that is because that's where we would drill, right? You want to drill a hole, you measure where the center of that hole is and drill there. So all of the bolt uh, distance requirements and layout requirements are from center of hole to center of hole because that's how you would fabricate it. Okay. So the first thing that we have is um, a minimum bolt spacing requirement. Now we can look that up. This, it's really straightforward. The spec says that the minimum bolt spacing requirement is two and two thirds times the bolt diameter. Okay. Now that's the minimum. Uh, the minimum standard. There is a preferred standard of three times the bolt diameter. But I'm more interested, at least for from you all, 
Why is this important? Like, I guess my question, what issues would arise in a bolted connection if the bolts got too close together? I'm curious. Potential weakness. No, okay, let, let's talk about that. These limits have nothing to do with strength. Nothing to do with load carrying capacity. We're not talking about that. Potential That's exactly right. How, like, the bolts have to be some distance apart to be able to facilitate the connection. I mean, something as simple as being able to get a wrench around a bolt. You got to have some space between the bolts and they be able to do that. Okay. So minimum bolt spacing requirements are there for erection facilitation to ensure that you can even put the thing together. Okay. That's what a minimum bolt spacing requirement is for. That if the bolts get too close together, they'll start knocking into each other. Okay. All right. So a distance of three diameters is preferred. Two and two thirds is the minimum. If we're in connection design land, I will tell you which one to employ. I won't let you just pick. You'll, you'll know. Okay, what about minimum edge distance? Okay, minimum edge distance is not something that you can calculate. It's something that you need to look up. And so what this is basically saying is if you have a plate and you have a hole, we're talking about the minimum distance here. That's what we're talking about, the minimum distance that we can uh, accommodate. Um, and this is something that you look up. So for example, for a three quarter inch diameter, um, uh, diameter uh, uh, hole uh, or diameter bolt, the minimum edge distance is one inch for a standard hole, okay? Now, this comes from uh, uh, fabric preferred fabrication practices as well. So just so you're aware, there are patterns to this, but the patterns aren't one-to-one -one perfect. I mean, these edge distances are based on workmanship tolerances and standard you know, practices in a fabrication setting. Um, to sort of explain it, I'm gonna veer away from steel and talk about wood. How many of you have ever used a power drill in wood before? Mo most of you probably have. So what do you think would happen if you had a plane of wood and you tried to drill a hole like right there, you know what I mean? That's going to be kind of tough, right? It's not really going to work very well, right? right? The, 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 um, the quality of the hole that you drill um, right there is going to be kind of tough, right? It's a little easier to develop a, a quality hole if the drill bit is a little bit away from the edge. Does that make sense? So these distances are based on that, on based on ensuring quality fabrication at the end of the day. So, so yeah, I mean, you can see like there's a pattern here that it's, you know, for a little bit, it's kind of like the diameter plus a quarter, but then like for seven eighths, it's one and one eighth, and for one and an eighth, it's one and a half. You know, I mean, there's, there's kind of a pattern, but not really. Um, so again, that just comes from standard fabrication practices. Okay, so those are minimum distances. What about maximums? Okay, so maximums are, are um, sort of lookups here, um, and I'm get, I'm developing these formulas by reading the spec. So, for example, if we look right here, the maximum distance from the center of any bolt hole to the nearest edge uh, shall be 12 times the thickness, but shall not exceed six inches. So, the maximum edge distance is the minimum of either 12 t or six inches. Now, for Bolt spacing, there's two provisions, okay? We have a provision A and a provision B. Now, I propose to you we're going to use provision B, but to explain that, I want to go back to the question. So, I think we're all kind of in agreement as to what would happen if bolts got too close together, but what happens if bolts get too far apart? What happens? And that one's a little harder to reason through. Okay, but let me ask you this. When you have a plate and a plate and you stick a bolt through them and you tighten that bolt, what happens to the plates? They're sandwiched together, right? So if the bolts get really, really far apart, oh, uh, man, my art is horrible. So if the bolts get really, really far apart, I propose that it's possible that we get a gap right here, that the bolt, that the plates aren't perfectly in contact. Now, why would a gap between steel plates be a problem? Water, water. Water, 
exactly right. And water is bad for steel in terms of corrosion, right? Okay, so if you read the spec, okay, so let's read what it says. It says, the longitudinal spacing of bolts between elements uh, shall be as follows. And what it says here, okay, for, for A, what does it say? It says, for painted members or unpainted members not subject to atmospheric corrosion, we've got this. But then for B, it says, for unpainted members or weathering steel that is subject to weathering corrosion, or, or, or is subject to at atmospheric corrosion, we have this, okay? So basically what it's saying is we have two limits, and one limit is more stringent if the member is going to be potentially subjected to corrosion, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use that one. We're gonna say that, um, unless otherwise stated, we're always gonna assume that we have unpainted steel or weathering steel uh, that, um, that is subjected to corrosion. Do you all know what I mean when I say weathering steel? If you don't, okay, weathering steel is, um, it is structural steel like any other, but the chemistry of that steel is slightly different. Um, for example, they'll throw a little bit of nickel into the mix, maybe you know, some extra vanadium, and, and I'm, I'm being very fast and loose because you know, it, it can slightly depend uh, differ, uh, dependent upon grade of steel. But the steel chemistry is altered such that the steel is designed to rust, that the steel is designed to develop a rust patina, and that rust patina sort of prevents further corrosion. So I say it's sort of designed to rust. It's actually designed to develop this patina that prevents further corrosion. If you're ever driving down the road and you see a bridge, that um, a steel bridge that's not painted, but it has sort of this like burgundy maroon color type thing, you know what I'm talking about? If you've ever driven down the road, you see sort of a new bridge and it's kind of like the steel is maroon, that, that's probably a weathering steel bridge. And that, it, if you actually look, that's actually kind of like a rust coating, if, if you will. So I just throw that out there for your, for your knowledge. So we, the steel per pound is a little bit more expensive, but you don't have to paint it. So, so there you go. Okay, so this is our layout requirement summary. This is uh, one of those Instagram type slides that has everything sort of in one slide where we have bolt spacing limitations and we have edge distance requirements all in one slide. So you have hashtag CE314 or CE414. So. I'm a dork, I know. Okay, so, uh, so I've got bolt spacing limitations and edge distance requirements all in one slide. And everything can be calculated except for minimum edge distances. That one you gotta kinda look up. Can't really do anything about that. Sound good? So now let's do an example. Okay, so I'm gonna take my keyboard off. Uh, and pull up my notebook here. Hold on, what's this? Okay, that's working. Okay. Okay. So this is a lap type connection. And whenever, if I ever say a lap connection, I just mean one plate sort of on top of another or a channel on top of a plate or an angle on top of a plate. If I ever say a lap type connection, LAP, that, that's what I'm talking about. When we get to welding, we're going to go through the different like connection geometries, like what's a lap, what's a T, what's a butt joint, all, all that. We'll, we'll cover that later. Um, but we're going to determine the design strength for this connection shown, and we're going to determine if the connection meets layout requirements. Okay. Now, um, the one thing I want to point out uh, just sort of globally about the, the, um, the problem is that if you look at the connection, what I've got is I've got a plate lapped on top of another plate, and both of these plates are 100% identical. Okay. They're both made of the same grade of steel. They're both the same thickness. The dimensions, the whole placement is exactly the same. I mean, it's literally like we took the exact same plates and bolted them together. So what that means is we're only gonna need to evaluate the bolt bearing capacity of one of them, okay? Remember, if we're looking at a connection, we either have the bearing capacity, or we, when a connection, a bolted connection, we're considering whether or not it fails, we either have the shear capacity of the bolts or the bearing capacity of the plates, okay? Now, in the real world, the plate, uh, the, the connection scenarios or the, the bearing scenarios are usually different, right? 
we're bolting like a channel to a plate or an angle to a plate or something like that. So there's theoretically two different cases of bolt bearing that you would need to evaluate. But you can usually reason through which one will govern, and we'll talk about that later. Okay? But for now, we only need to look at one. Okay? So we have A36 steel for the, all the steel. We have 7 8 inch diameter A325 bolts. Now, A325, that's group 120 in the manual, so I threw that in there. We're going to assume that the threads are excluded from the shear plane, and we are also going to determine if the connection meets layout requirements. Okay. So uh, I want to take our time with this. It's really not that difficult, but uh, let's just sort of work our way through it. Okay. And so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to assess bolt shear. Okay, so do y'all remember what guide we can use? We got that nifty little guide in the manual we can use. Table 7-1. Remember the green and the blue one? This is one you definitely want to break out. Okay, I do want to make sure everybody can find that. If you have not yet tabbed that in your manual, I would. This is, you're going to use this a lot. Okay? And again, this is our first guide that actually has sort of the colors. And, and what I will say is that when it comes to the, um, uh, the spec, you can download the shape database for free. You can download the spec for free, but what you pay for are these design aids. Okay, so tell me what I need to know in table one in order to be able to look up the capacity. Okay, so what's that? Okay, so let, let's start there. So we got a bolt diameter of what? What is the bolt diameter for this problem? Seven eighths of an inch. Okay, what else do we need uh, that's in table 7 1? What relevant data uh, in table 7 1 that we're going to need? What about the group? Let's go a step further. Is it group 120N or 120X? X, because it's threads excluded. Now, I seem to be missing something. Is there something else I'm missing? I mean, if I go to group 120X, 7 8 inch diameter bolts, I get two values in LRFD. Why am I getting two values? Single or double shear. And so my question to the class is, is this a single shear connection or is this a double shear connection? It's a single shear connection because there, if we look up here, there is only one shear plane passing through the bolts, right? Right? Plate, plate going like that. We're only shearing through the bolts once, okay? So this is single shear. Maybe it's the laptop. I'll turn that off. No, it's not. I don't know what that is. Okay. All right. So from these uh, values, can, can somebody tell me what is the shear capacity per bolt? What is the shear capacity per bolt? Thirty point seven. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. So that is thirty point seven kips per bolt. Okay. So is that the capacity of the connection? No. That is the capacity per connector. The capacity of the connection is thirty point <coughs> seven times what? Four, because there's four bolts, right? One, two, three, four. So therefore. VRN is what? Mm 
So maybe what I'll do is I'll do it like this. I'll say VRN times the number of bolts. For, you, for those that are hyper unit conscious, the bolts cancel. Okay, so now we have a value, okay? And what we can then do, bless you, is look at another limit state. We have another limit state. We have a limit state of bolt bearing, okay? So what we'll do is we have bolt shear, we have bolt bearing, we'll uh, calculate another VRM. And then to be clear, we could look at gross section yielding, net section fracture, block shear rupture, all of that. And I think I've got some of those values already computed. Uh, oh, no, I don't. I can, I can bring those next time. But what we'll take those and assess them and, and take the minimum, just like we have before. Okay. Everybody with me so far? Okay. All right. Bolt bearing capacity. Let me do this. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to redraw the plate because I don't want to have to um, keep going up, scrolling up and down like crazy. So let's... There's that. Yeah, I can do better than that. We have this, and we are taking the plate and yanking on it like this. Now, just so we're clear, um, how many edge bolts do we have, and how many interior bolts do we have? Let me, let me ask it this way. Let me ask it this way. Uh, all right, so in this connection, remember this connection, these were the edge bolts, these were the interior bolts. So we had four edge bolts, we had 16 interior bolts. Okay, so on this connection, how many edge bolts and how many interior bolts do we have? Two and two. Two and two. Okay, and so a final question. These bolts, are these the edge bolts or the interior bolts? Those are the edge bolts, exactly right, okay. So just to make sure we're on the same page. So, let's put some dimensions here. Okay, what was this distance? Three inches. Three inches. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to say that this is the S value. That's the longitudinal spacing. And this value right here? Two inches. Two inches. This is LE. Okay? Because when we do our block shear check, or our mini block shear check with bolt tear out, we're going in this direction. Okay. All right, so like I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this slide, but I'm going to sort of work backwards. I'm going to start at the bottom and work my way up, okay? And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to compute the hole diameter, okay? Now, we were given we were given that the bolt diameter is 7 eighths of an inch, right? So therefore, the hole diameter is that plus an eight, right? Wrong, okay? Remember, this is 1 16th, okay? So I'm going to put right here like a big, a big warning right there is that that's not 1 8. We are using the actual dimensions of the hole here, not the additional material that we take away to account for 
its ability to transfer stress to the member as a whole. We're looking at the actual connection here. So not 1A, okay? So this is Fifteen sixteenths, right? Because seven eighths is fourteen sixteenths plus one sixteenth is fifteen sixteenths. Y'all with me on that? Pretty simple, right? Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to compute an LCE and an LCI. Okay. Let's do LCE first. Now, just so that we're all physically clear, what LCE is? LCE. is this distance. That's LCE, okay? And how do we compute LCE? Like, let's just sort of reason through. How do we do that? Not the bolt diameter, but the hole diameter. Yes, you're, but you're, you're right, you're right. So we take LE Minus 15 over 32. Or if you want, we'll, we'll, we'll stop skipping steps. Okay. Now, what do we get as an answer for that? Let's, we'll use decimals because I'm sure that's enough fractions for everybody today. Like, I'm an engineer. I don't like fractions. One point five three. I'm going to go one further. I'll say 1.531 just so that we're all seeing you know, where the values come from. I would not go any further than this uh, in a real world setting. Okay, LCI. So LCI is the clear distance between interior bolts. So that that's this distance. So how do I compute this distance right here? How do I compute that? Exactly, because we take a half from here and a half from here, so it's just the whole thing. So we'll say and let's go one more, let's get one more value here. What do we get here? Say it again. Okay, 2.063. All right. And by the way, let's just make sure that we're all clear with this. I mean, those equations, I mean, we reason through it, but I mean, they're all here. And, I mean, it's, it's already dry for us. Okay, so this is our expression that we're using. So let me rewrite that. So Okay, so this is going to be our, our sort of governing equation for bearing. This right here. Okay, so we've got our LCs figured out. We know what the bolt diameter is. That's 7 eighths. So the only thing we need is the thickness and FU. Okay, so note, what's the thickness of this plate? Half inch. It's a half inch. That was given to us at the beginning. And what about FU? Say it again. 58. It's 58 KSI. And that's because it's A36 steel. Now I denoted table 2-5 instead of 2-4 because 2-5 is the table for plates and bars, whereas table 2-4 is for roll shapes. But the values for A36 are the same in either table. So I'm being a little nitpicky there, but I did want to um, make sure that I'm indicating the difference there. Okay, so we've got everything we need. We've got thicknesses, FUs, LCs, DVs. So, so we're ready to start rocking and rolling. And so um, I'm going to show you how I do this. The, re the way that I do this is uh, I want you to have to hit as few buttons on your calculator as possible. So here's how I do it, okay? 
So we'll call this um, we'll call this intermediate calculations. So I'm going to calculate three values. Okay, the first value I'm going to calculate. is this, 1.2 LC TFU, but I'm calculating the LCE, okay? Bless you. So 1.2. So tell me what you get here. We'll go like, we can go one decimal place. It doesn't really matter at this point. One or two. Fifty-three point three kips. Do I have a second on that? Leave that value in your calculator, by the way. Do I have a second? Yeah. Okay, now watch this. Just bear with me. So now I want to compute 1.2 L-C-I-T-F-U, which is 1.2 times 2.063 times uh, times that. Now, the reason I say leave that value in your calculator, because if you want, you could just take 53.3, divide it by that, and multiply it by that. You can just do that. It's a lot easier. Or you can calculate it all out. It doesn't really matter. But tell me what you get for this value. 71.8. .8. Do I have a second? Yep. Okay. And then the last one, 2.4. Okay. Tell me what we get here. Anybody have an answer for me on this one? Six zero point nine. Do I have a second? Yeah. Okay. All right. So we the reason why I want to compute these three intermediate ones first is because now I want to start evaluating this. So this is our nominal capacity expression. But remember, we've got different LC values. Okay. So what I propose we're going to have is we're going to have an RNE and an RNI. Okay. Now RNE is going to be the minimum of... Uh, 1.2 LCE TFU and the bottom. But RNI is going to be the minimum going to be the minimum of that. So what I'm doing is I'm changing the top row. So the first expression is the minimum of these two, and the second is the minimum of these two. Okay. So that's why I say like I like intermediate calcs. I like to go ahead and just compute all the rows to make this step a lot easier. Because if I skip this, then i got to compute all this all over again. I think it's just a lot messier. Okay. So what is R and E? What is this one going to be? 53.3. 53.3. Okay. And this one is, now remember from a behavior standpoint, remember that these two correspond to tear out. And this one corresponds to ovalization. So what we're basically saying is that the edge bolts, they're going to tear out. But the interior bolts, 
they're going to oblize. Okay. Now, can anybody think of a simple way, if I didn't want tear out to happen on the edge bolts, how would I do that? What's a simple way of doing that? Like, think through the math. Like, look at the connection. What would be a way of ensuring that the edge bolts do not tear out? Why don't I just take these four bolts and just scooch them this way? Because if I scooch them this way, I'm going to increase LE. If I increase LE, I'm going to increase LCE. If I increase LCE, I'm going to increase this. And if this value gets bigger than 60.9, that's going to go. Does, does that make sense? So I just like I just want you to think behaviorally what's going to happen to the connection and what's a simple way of, of you know avoiding it. That's not to say you need to do that. I just want you to think behaviorally about what's going on. Okay. Now, what we've got here is a nominal capacity per edge bolt and a nominal capacity per interior bolt. I ask you as the class, how do I compute the nominal capacity of the section as a whole? How do I do that? Tell me what to do. Let me give you an analogy. Up here, we had the capacity per bolt. And we multiplied by the number of bolts to get the capacity overall. I ask you, tell me what to do. How do I get from, how do I get from capacity per bolt, capacity per bolt, to capacity of the whole connection. Tell me what to do. Multiply R and E by 2, multiply R and I by 2, and then E by 2. There you go. Because the connection contains two edge bolts and two interior bolts. Does that make sense? That, that's really all I'm asking for here. Like this example here, this one would be 4 RNE plus 16 RNI, right? So that, that's really kind of the idea here. So do I have a value here? Second, is that the design capacity of the connection? You're shaking your head no. Why? It's multiplied by phi. It's forgot phi. Yeah. So phi What is phi rn? That 7 looks oddly like a 2, so Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, so now we have a bolt bearing capacity. What do we do with this bolt bearing capacity? Well, let me ask you a simpler question. What is the design capacity of this connection? Well, okay, let me ask you a different way. When you had a tension member, and I gave you a gross section yielding limit state, a net section fracture limit state, and a block shear limit state, and I asked you how much is the capacity of the, of the member, how do you determine that if I give you those three values? The minimum. The minimum, right? So if I have a bolt shear capacity and a bolt bearing capacity, what is the capacity? The minimum, which is if I have 171.3 and I have 122.8, the minimum is 122.8. So therefore, so if we do summary, We have 122.8 kips as our answer. Okay, 
So my apologies, we went through all this hullabaloo to get 120 or 171.3, and in the end it didn't govern. You know, but we wouldn't have known that if we hadn't gone through the exercise. Okay. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now we've got one other thing I want to do, which is to check the layout requirements. Okay, so what I mean by that is, remind me, what is the bolt spacing? What, what was the bolt spacing? Three inches. And what's LE? Two inches. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to compare that against S min. And S max. Anybody remember what S min was? Anybody remember that from our lecture today? That's okay, because I just threw it at you today. Eight thirds times the bolt diameter. And uh, just to remind everybody, this was the Instagram picture that has all the bolt spacing requirements and edge distance requirements. So for minimum bolt spacing, it's two and two thirds of the diameter, or eight thirds. So eight thirds of the bolt diameter. What was the bolt diameter? Seven eighths. Is what? Two point three three. And then S max is the minimum of fourteen T and seven inches. And as for T. T should be the thickness of the thinner part, okay? But in this problem, it doesn't really matter because they're both the same. So it's the minimum. That's ah, bad. I can do that one in my head because half of 14 is 7. So the minimum of 7 and 7 is 7. So does this connection meet bolt spacing requirements? Yeah, it does. I mean, because it's between. Because between these two, there's that. Okay? LE min. Now, how do we get LE min? Remember? That, that's the one we got to look up, right? We got to look that up on page one or page one thirty nine in the spec. So let's find that. So we have the minimum edge distance from the center of the standard hole to the edge, and what is that for a seven eighths inch diameter bolt? One and an eighth. One and an eighth. Okay, here I'll say, I'll even put the page number. Everybody able to find that? In chapter J? Okay, good. All right, so the only thing left to do is LE max. And that's the minimum. of 12T and 6 inches, which again is going to be pretty easy. So that's pretty easy, right? So what is the answer, I guess? Does the connection meet layout requirements? Yes, it does. There we 
we go. Not too shabby, right? Not too hard. Like, again, ho hopefully the takeaway is this is easy. I, I like, I want to be clear, connection design can be very challenging, you know, uh, when you start getting into more complex connection scenarios. But a lot of the elements of connection design, a lot of the component by component math, is still pretty easy. So um, uh, that's really sort of my, my goal here. Um, oh, does anybody have any questions on this? Okay, I want to pull up the homework just to kind of give you an idea of what's going on here. So here's the problem. The problem is a channel connected to a plate, and you're going to basically do a lot of the same thing that we've done here. Um, a couple of things that are worth mentioning. This is a tension member, so you could evaluate gross section yielding, net section fracture, block to rupture. Do not do that. Do not do slenderness limitations or anything like that. Just the stuff we've done today. Um, and only evaluate bolt bearing for the, the channel, not the plate. I didn't give you enough data on the plate to be able to do it anyway, because I didn't tell you what, how thick it was, and I didn't tell you what the um, material was for the plate. But we have a C18 by, or C8 by 18.75 of A36 steel, and basically go through that exercise. I think you're gonna find this is a pretty rote, straightforward assignment. So something pretty simple for those of you to have a celebration in 13 minutes. So, sound good? Any? Yes. Is it, is it bread that's included on that one or no? That's a great question. I didn't tell you. And if I didn't tell you, what should you do? No. No. We. <laughs> no. Hold on. What? So if you don't know, assume the worst case scenario. So and it's possible. So the reason one of the, I'll say this. So it is something that I do want you to get comfortable with because. When you're in a design scenario, it's often you may not know. So I, I purposefully left that out. So. All right, any questions? All right, I'm going to stop the recording, pull the code up for anybody who missed it, and you all have good luck on your environmental exam.